Hi. Hi, everyone. Good evening. On the occasion of International Women's Day, I wish all the inspiring, radiant, strong, determined, and career-oriented uh, in women intensivist and critical care aspirants a very happy Women's Day. It's a great honor to have ISCCM President Professor Pradeep Kumar Bhattacharya, immediate past President Professor Sheila Nayan Matra, and President elect uh, Dr. Srinivas Samavedam with us for this webinar uh, discussing on women in critical care, the theme being harnessing Shakti. Now, I request Professor Pradeep Bhattacharya to give his welcome note to the ISCCM members and participants of the webinar. Sir, over to you. Thank you. Uh, this is a special day, and we call it an international. Uh, as uh, we all know, and so, so that uh, things are also changing as far as women are concerned in the entire world. So, <clears throat> first and foremost is that I welcome all the panelists who have shown their interest and in, uh, discussing about uh, this important issue in this important day. And as usual, she has taken the presentation in this uh, panel discussion and realized uh, I was sitting for an interview in my, my microbiology department for one of their projects. And uh, there was a post for, and um, because the amount of uh, remunerations which they offered was high, uh, they wanted uh, good candidates to be there. And then I uh, saw there were four ladies who entered one after another. And uh, from every lady, what I saw that uh, uh, the head of microbiology was asking the same question, which I, I we always discuss. How many kids do you have? Are you married or unmarried? I hope you are not pregnant. So these universal questions, I saw that he kept on asking with all the female members. So I think uh, that uh, reminded me when I was arguing with Sheila that uh, Sheila said, no, you know, Pradeep, this is important. But I never uh, thought about it seriously because I thought it was a part of this thing. Uh, when when I came to when I saw this thing today, uh, and it was uh, really because now we have started discussing all these things in our uh, forum, formal forums. I found that it is really hurting for any female appearing in, a, <clears throat> in an interview and getting such kind of questions from interviewer. So that's why I think we will continue this uh, important discussion throughout the year. My tenure, I think in future also we'll keep in continuing all these discussions. These are very, very important. How we can take care of all these kind of purposes, we have to see and we have to come out with very, very practical solutions so that in future none of our uh, female members in the, in the society, in profession, or in family should have uh, a, a feeling of uh, you know, complex or inferiority complex or this kind of thing. So that is why it is important. So uh, I'm sorry because uh, I'm today <laughs> I had to travel and went to Lucknow. So because of uh, uh, this, uh, I had to take one exam. And uh, um, I start this program and I hand over uh, this uh, entire thing to. I know that Srinivas is there. Srinivas will conduct the whole show. I may not be available for the panel, but. Uh, very good answers and I know they are realized in their C1 and army for this uh, discussion. So, <laughs> so I uh, congratulate and welcome you again and uh, thank you. Thank you.
Thank you, Dr. Pradeep. I now invite Professor Sheila Nanan Maitra, the immediate past president of RCCM, to enlighten us on the latest survey conducted on the diversity, equality, and inclusion initiative that has been recently adopted by RCCM. And uh, Professor Sheila uh, is our was our first female president of RCCM, and she needs no introduction. So over to you, Sheila, ma'am. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, before I just share my slides, I'd like to say. Uh, firstly, a very, very happy, belated, but a happy Women's Day to all the wonderful women uh, who are attending this. And not only to the women, but also to the men, because they have to celebrate the women in their life. Maybe their wives, maybe their girlfriends, maybe their daughters, all the women in their life, their sisters or whatever. So it's a, it's a great celebration and we uh, celebrate Women's Day not only today, but every day of our lives. We should respect and celebrate, uh, you know, the beauty of being a woman and just the way we are. So uh, that's one. And secondly, I hope you all enjoyed Criticare. And I want to congratulate uh, the new leadership. Uh, I want to congratulate the president, Pro Professor uh, Pradeep Bhattacharya, uh, General Secretary uh, Bharat Jagyasi, the immediate past, uh, I mean, the president-elect, uh, uh, Dr. Srinivas uh, Samvedam, who will be arranging all our webinars. And he started on a very high note, taking the Women's uh, Day initiative forward. And the entire executive committee, and I'm very, very uh, confident that the new leadership will really take this uh, agenda as many more forward. So let's start on a very positive note. And I want to share, I will share my screen with you. I hope you can uh, see this. Uh, can you all see this? Can you see yes, my screen? Yes, we yes, can. Yes, yes, yes ma'am. So, uh, just one minute. Uh, yeah. So I... So uh, I'm going to uh, talk to you today about the ISCCM position statement on improving gender balance uh, in critical care. Now, many of you may not be aware of this uh, as well. And this was an initiative of a committee that we formed. And just before I, uh, Dr. Pradeep spoke about, um, you know, interviews, and it's very interesting because when we would have interviews for our own staff in ISCCM, you know, it really amazed me because this question would be asked, you know, I, are you married? Are you planning to have a family? And these questions would be asked and it's really a subconscious bias. And I would think in my mind that at this rate, no young woman uh, who's planning to have a baby will have, will get a job, you know, uh, not only in ISCCM, but in other organizations, if people start having, asking these questions and having bias. And these issues became more and more relevant. And we felt that we should take this up uh, within ISCCM. Uh, I just want to start with a little introduction about uh, the committee. So I'm sure you've all heard of the DEI committee. Now, DEI is not a new term, not coined by ICCM. DEI stands for diversity, equity, and inclusion. So this committee was started for ICCM in 2023. And it was not only for gender balance, but the agenda, the objective of this committee was to improve diversity within ISCCM and give equal opportunities to all members of the society. And this includes to improve gender balance, participation of young members and regional representative also in our society. So it's not only about uh, gender, but it's about all aspects of diversity uh, within the Indian Society of Critical Care Medicine. And I also want to tell you that most international societies have a DEI committee and they also have a position on uh, you know, gender balance within their uh, society. And I'm very, very proud to say in 2024 in the AGM, we have included this committee in the constitution. So it's not only something that will be there for one year, but the DEI committee will continue uh, as now it is now incorporated in the constitution. So I'm really, really proud to this first DEI committee. I was of course there as a president, but uh, the chairperson of our society was uh, Dr. Prachi Sate and uh, the coordinator was Dr. Urvi Shukla. We also had many young dynamic uh, members. Uh, we had Dr. Bhuvna Krishna, Minita Panagri, Dr. Diptimala Agarwal, Dr. Farad Kapadia. It was not only females, but also males on the committee. Uh, Dr. Gunjan Chanchalani, Dr. Lilavati Thakur, Dr. Lina Patil, Dr. Nita George, who is here, Dr. Rekha Das, Dr. Reshu Gupta, Dr. Sumit Re, and Dr. Susruta Bandhupadhyay. We also had our ex-official members who were part of the EC, Dr. Mishra, Dr. Vaipi Singh, Dr. Bharat Jagyasi, and Dr. Pradeep Bhattacharya. And I'm really, really grateful to this dynamic group 
of the first DI committee of ISCCM who really, uh, you know, understood and helped and supported me uh, in taking this uh, agenda forward. Uh, and I'll also talk about what the work that has been done so far so that this can be taken forward. So first thing, the DI committee, you know, we had no baseline data about where we are. So the first thing we did is we conducted two surveys, nationwide surveys. And first one was on the effect of gender on career progression among our critical care students. And the second one was what were the barriers to equality in critical care. And these two surveys, the results of which are shortly going to be published in IJCCM, were real eye-openers to us. And this served as a baseline, you know, to tell us where to start and how we can take uh, things forward. Uh, I won't be sharing the data of the surveys because that's uh, going to be published very soon. But based on this, uh, we also drafted various domains for the ISCCM position statement for improving gender balance in critical care. So it's not only within ISCCM, but some recommendations that ISCCM gives uh, for, uh, you know, uh, improving the gender balance. And uh, also in our, we have certain SOPs that we have made for our ISCCM conferences. And what we have included is that at every national meeting, we select 10 young intensivists as speakers. And this is done through a competitive process. And young speakers are those who are under the age of 45. So we have a competitive process. People apply. And we ensure that these 10, speak 10 individuals who are selected uh, are incorporated as speakers within, not in a separate hall, but they are part of the, as any other speakers and get all the benefits of the speakers. So it's done through a competitive process. In addition, we have also incorporated that we should make efforts to have good regional representation. So it should not just be people from metros but we, or, or certain regions, but we should try to have uh, good representation uh, nationwide. So these are some of the work that was done through the GA, DI committee. To, of course, major part was about uh, gender balance, but we also looked at uh, including young people and also regional representation. Now I'm going to talk straight away about uh, the position statement that we made on uh, on gender balance. So before I tell you about that, I want to tell you that this was done through very sound methodology. We used a Delphi process. It wasn't just 10 people sitting together and saying, okay, this should be the position statement for ISCCM. So first a steering committee was formed from, from six members from the DI committee. And uh, the, we also had a methodologist on board and then we used a Delphi process. So proper scientific method was adopted for generating cons uh, consensus because this was an area, of course, where we don't have so much evidence and we just use the data from the survey as baseline data. So we formed an expert panel and who were the expert panels? These were some members of the DI committee. We uh, engaged with the past presidents, general secretaries, and also some ISCC members were included. And each, whoever we included as a member on the expert panel did not know who the other member was. And the reason we didn't, uh, you know, maintain anonymity was to avoid any bias, uh, you know, or any group pressure. Uh, if people, members of the committee knew who each other were, then there would be some group pressure or some uh, bias. And therefore, till the very end, we maintain anonymity of the expert panel. And we tried to make a concerted, as you know, all the past presidents were males. So we could not have a committee of expert panel of only males. So a lot of female members uh, from the uh, the ISCCM was also included uh, in the expert panel. And we made had a regionally uh, good, uh, you know, uh, balance, gender balance. And then once they accepted, we sent emails to all of them. And then the Delphi survey was started. And we had several iterative rounds. We had about four to five rounds until we achieved consensus and stability. And the questions that we posed to them were in the form of either multiple choice questions or we had a Likert scale statements. We used a seven point Likert scale and there had to be consensus we took as 70% uh, or more from the experts on a particular option for the multiple choice. Uh, you know, and the way we rated it was a score of five to seven was agreement or if it was one to three, it was disagreement. So that is the way that we looked at it. And we, as I mentioned, there had to be consensus and each round subsequently we moved more and more towards consensus until maximum consensus could be achieved. And then based on this, we drafted the 15 position statements for the ISCCM. I just want to say that it was, um, you know, the reason why we involved all the past presidents were because they have been the stakeholders to general secretaries and past presidents. And they are the people who understand the ISCCM, understand the needs and situation. And in addition to this, we also took other members. So uh, the reason I'm putting you through this is because it was a very sound methodology that we used. We didn't just sit together and have a few members deciding what the position statement for the ISCCM uh, should be. So I'm just going to very quickly tell you what the 15 position statements that we have 
uh, drafted for the society are sorry i'm not able to change my slides Yes. Okay. So these are the statements. Now these were in two parts. One is at the workplace. So these are the general recommendations by ISCM, and the second group is and for better representation in ISCM. So uh, workforce recruitment. I hope all of you can see my screen and hear me. Uh, Dr. Shrinivas, can you please confirm that? Yeah. Yes. Yes. yes, yes please, so, so related to workforce <laughs> recruitment. So these are fifteen <laughs> statements, as I said. The first is on workforce recruitment. So the recruitment of female staff in critical care medicine should be independent of their plan for marriage, plan to have children or spouse income. And questions related to this should be avoided. So even spouse income, because a lot of people ask, you know, how much does your husband earn? Your husband earns so much money. Why do you want so much salary? A lot of time women uh, workforce are paid less than their male counterparts for the same job. So these questions should not be asked. Are you married is okay, but plan to have married or plan to have children can definitely create some bias while you know giving a job to someone. Pay parity should exist between male and female staff with equivalent credentials and work profile. Uh, we had a lot of feedback that female uh, members are uh, you know given lesser salaries in comparison to their male counterparts for the same work and the same position. This may not be seen in government hospitals where I work, where male and female have their equal salary, but I, I understood for many uh, people and also from our survey that in private, it's a completely different situation. So this is related to workforce recruitment. Now, addressing healthcare workers. Now, this is very interesting. Now, a lot of time, the female doctors are called nurses. A lot of time, I don't know how many of you have experienced it or they are not you know recognized as being doctors. So to prevent female doctors from being identified as paramedics, one of the options that was suggested that they could be introduced by the doctors to the visitors or the family members or could even wear name badges of doctors. So for instance, in my rounds, I often say this is Dr. So-and-so, Dr. So-and-so, and we introduce them like that to the family and this avoids uh, the situation where the family member thinks that uh, you know the female doctor is actually a nurse or some other paramedical staff. And female staff should be introduced or addressed as equivalent to their male counterparts in professional organizations in con and conferences. It has often been noted that, you know, say in panel discussions or in this thing, you know, somebody may be addressed for just to give you an example, they may be addressed as uh, Professor Pradeep Bhattacharya, but they might say Sheila, call me Sheila. Though they are close to both of us, the male is often given a very uh, you know, dignified title of what he is, whereas a female may just be addressed by her first name. Though the person who is doing this may be close to both the members. So this is something we have to take care of and female staff should be introduced or addressed equivalent to the male counterparts. Uh, the other thing is we use gender neutral titles and designations. For example, everywhere where it was chairman, we have now changed it to chairperson, including in the constitution. So if you see various committees, we don't say chairman, chairman, we say chairperson. So as far as possible, one should use gender neutral titles. So this is about addressing healthcare workers. Then about workplace inclusivity. Now, if it is feasible, irrespective of gender, healthcare workers should be permitted flexibility in working hours, provided the it's for a genuine family related issue and for a limited period. Now, I think the ISCCM, the males and the females gave very balanced statements, you know, there was nothing about, oh, give time away to females or females should get this. It was very balanced. They said, irrespective of gender, any healthcare worker who has a family-related issue. So it may be even a male who wants to take time away to look after his child. So if it is a genuine reason and it's for a limited period, if it is feasible, they should be given time off. And the number seven is the infrastructural arrangements for female staff in the ICU should include availability of separate changing rooms, separate toilets, and also rest areas. Then maternity leave should be provided for female staff as per existing national laws. And point number nine is equal work distribution and opportunity in academic activities, research and professional growth should be provided to the staff in the same position irrespective of the gender. So it shouldn't be that even nurses said that, you know, sometimes female nurses are made to work much more or given a lot of workload compared to male nurses or, you know, this kind of, there should be equal equality in the distribution, not only of work, but even uh, various opportunities, academic opportunities uh, should be equally dis distributed. Now, this is very important. Prevention of harassment and bullying. 
this was also an important address uh, this thing it was not much spoken about but from the survey anonymized survey we understood that this is very very much existent even in our critical care community and uh, what we the point number 10 is that the measures to prevent harassment and bullying of female employees in the workplace should include now i don't know how many of you are aware of posh but when we asked the females even on the dei committee they were not aware of posh so posh is prevention of sex sexual harassment and this is part of a, this is an indian act it's already there uh, in our laws but many people are unaware of it and uh, you know institutions should have training programs at the workplace uh, so that women know what are their rights and what all they can you know what is acceptable what is not acceptable and it is essential not only to have a posh committee but also to have training programs on this at the workplace. And many organizations have it, especially in the corporate world, but many uh, organizations are not even aware of it and don't even know that this is part of the Indian laws. And we have a posh act that pe people should be aware of, but neither were women nor were males aware of it. So this was something that was very important. Then provision for non-judgmental anonymized reporting and redressal mechanism should be there. There should be a separate committee to address, investigate harassment and bullying cases. And the fourth was appropriate and transparent action should be taken against the offenders. So this was the fourth, you know, this was the four sub parts of the statement on measures to prevent harassment and bullying of female employees at the workplace. So all this took uh, together, the four um, uh, domains that we addressed were for workplace recruitment. And these are the ISC same position statements. And this could be very well adopted by any other organizations uh, if they wish. Now, more importantly, for ISCCM, we had this, uh, the next important domain was representation in ISCCM. So, related to conferences, uh, what we said is to improve female participation in ISCCM annual conferences, we said babysitting facilities should be provided. This is if requested. So, this was something that we included. There were many other things that we asked, but we did not get consensus on that. But definitely, many women are not able to come because they are uh, you know, their children are left at home or they have small children and if these facilities should be provided if someone asks for them. Then to improve female representation in academic meetings, active effort should be taken to identify female speakers for a particular topic. Uh, we often see there are, there are certain topics, there are very good female uh, speakers, but we don't make active efforts to identify who are the women who are working on certain areas, doing research and who are actively uh, you know, uh, doing, um, uh, you know, publishing in that area or interested in that area. So it is often the same male speakers uh, or, you know, so the same old boys club that gets included. So ICCM should make an active effort to identify, uh, you know, the female speakers. And we are very good people uh, out there. So there was no consensus for having any quota for women, but definitely they said there should be uh, efforts to take in uh, to identify female speakers for the topic. And also to conduct mentorship programs for women because many of them are not coming forward. So we need to have some kind of mentorship program should be conducted. So this is related to the conferences. The next was related to electoral positions. Now here, of course, again, no consensus for any quota or anything like that. I think we had a very balanced statements that have been drafted. What they said is to improve female representation on the ISCCM executive committee, college board, and all these positions where there are elections or as journal editor where we will have elections now, women should be actively encouraged to stand for ISCCM elections. And I'm very proud to say that, uh, you know, um, uh, all the women who have stood after I won the ISCCM election for president, all the women who have stood for various positions, not a single woman has lost an election. So, you know, we can't really blame the male counterparts. We have to come forward. We have to stand for these positions so that we win elections and we can, uh, you know, be, uh, you know, represent um, ISCCM and work forward rather than say that, oh, we are not given an opportunity. So this was what was decided for electoral positions. And the last statement was related to nominated positions. Now, what do we mean by nominated positions? We have various ISCCM committees, we have uh, like scientific committee, guidelines committee. We also have journal, newsletter, editorial boards, etc. So here, uh, of course, there's no election, but this should be in proportion to our membership ratio. So in our membership, we have 30% women. So for all these committees of ISCCM, when nominations are there, it should not be only male representative, but at least 30% of the members uh, should be uh, uh, females and active efforts should be uh, taken to make sure that, you know, there is good representation of women. So there was consensus among the 
uh, experts that for nominated positions, it should be in proportion to the membership of the society. So these are the 15 uh, positions that, uh, you know, statements that I told you that have been generated to, through consensus uh, for domains for at the workplace and the representation in ISCCM that is for the conferences for electoral positions and nominated positions. These are the 15 position statements that we have. They are also on the website. Or if you go on the ISCCM website under About Us, now we have the ISCCM position status, status statement on gender balance in critical care. And this will also shortly be published in the IJCCM. So with that, I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Happy to take any questions. Sheila, I have a question. Yes, please. Uh, you see, these, uh, like in the Indian constitution, we have all the uh, laws laid down mm -hmm. for gender equality, but uh, practice, putting it into practice is very difficult. So how will we ensure or the uh, different, you know, the ISCCM position statements are for the, uh, the entire critical care community in India. So how will we ensure that these uh, position statements are followed in different areas? Different places. That's a very good question. And uh, see, it's a, it's a big step, I think. And we have a position statement of ISCCM. You know, just saying we should do this, we should do this is all good. It's good for a webinar. It's good for that. But once you have a, so this is going to be published. You know, the world over, people will look at a publication. This is the ISCCM position statement. It's on our website. You know, so these are 15 things that have been generated through consensus of our leadership. And this committee going for, is also there in our constitution. The constitution, uh, you know, even in, in, in the Indian uh, constitution says, talks about various things, but it doesn't specify that A, B, C, D has to be done. So definitely going forward, I'm sure now Dr. Pradeep will be forming committees. Dr. Srinivas will be forming committees. We already have this, that wherever nominated positions, we need 30%. We need representation in proportion to the membership of the society. So I'm sure even without that, I'm sure both these individuals, uh, you know, they are all for promoting uh, uh, females uh, in representation in the society. But I'm sure they'll do it. And uh, this is already there. And as far as electoral things, I mean, that is, you know, we really have to come forward and we have to stand for the election. And I was very happy that even the males or the females did not say that we have to have a quota because women are in no less... Uh, inferior to males. It's just that we're not coming forward and we're not, you know, getting there. So I think it's a big step and we have the position statement on our website and we have SOPs already for our conferences, which are, include all these things. So I have made sure in my tenure that this is incorporated. It should not just be a one-year thing that, you know, Sheila did. It should be something going forward. Only then we can make a positive change for our society. So I'm sure these will be implemented by the leadership going forward. Thank you. Any more questions? Ma'am, I would like to ask a question. Uh, Ma'am, in our uh, setup, it is uh, basically a central institute. Uh, most of them are officially appointed. And yes, we have uh, what I would like to mention is that, yes, we have more of the women uh, workforce as compared to, uh, to the male workforce. So uh, how do we encourage um, young doctors among the women's uh, to Sorry, I, I'm not able to hear it. Social obligations. Like, how do we encourage them? How do we change their mindset? Because this is what uh, they always put forward. Like, this line really takes a lot of our time. We have to get up in the middle of the night, come and see the patients, because it is quite a demanding um, profession, I feel, uh, uh, compared to other super speciality. Right. Uh, I agree with you. But I, I must say this, that if you choose critical care as your profession, then you know what you're getting then you cannot say that I'm a woman, I have to manage my family, so I will work less. That's not acceptable. I think that is not acceptable because once you, you choose a profession where you know you're going to, you're going to, you know. So I, I don't buy into that thing that women should be given any discounts, you know, other than related to maternity or something when they take a profession like this, uh, you know. So it requires, of course, more mentorship and uh, this thing. But this, uh, and I'm very happy that the committee also did not give any, uh, you know, discounts related to work uh, when we drafted our position statements. And I'm sure all of you agree that, you know, women can work as much as male works. Mm -hmm. The reason why there are less women in critical care is, of course, it's more labor intensive and they also have more family uh, obligations. So they choose 
other specialties but the women who come into critical care have no excuse for not uh, you know <laughs> uh, performing as well as uh, males do this is just my um, thing but i'm sure you all agree with me i think the mindset can only change by looking at examples of our seniors so we have so many examples each day we are uh, you know getting to witness uh, great heights achieved by women in critical care so i think it is changing and it will change in a very fast pace so over I to you ani of as an inspiration because all of you are working equivalent or even better than some of your male counterparts so you really serve as an inspiration to the younger generation is it not yes ma'am with you all uh, yes i think uh, we'll have a greater workforce part participation in critical care in the coming days rani ma'am over to you ma'am thank you thank you so much professor sheela mathra ma'am uh, points are well taken points are well taken and uh, carried to the future years and uh, hope they get implemented in coming years thank you for that and now we start our panel discussion on harnessing shakti the women take so first my question goes to dr geeta george uh who's a hod uh department of critical care at vps lakeshore hospital kochi uh, ma'am now you've been working in critical care for more than 20 years so what made you to choose uh, to become an intensivist and do you think the in recent years the um, do you see any more crit, uh, women taking critical care um Hi. jobs and uh, do you see any change in trends yes uh thanks uh, dr lakshmi i uh, basically am an anesthesiologist and while doing anesthesia i found that uh you know your ability to manage any complication coming under anesthesia and the really sick patients in anesthesia requires knowledge of critical care and then going forward into the critical care unit so initially i um, did critical care in order to become a better anesthesiologist you know and i found that you know i can troubleshoot problems i can put icds i can do an echo i can figure out what's going wrong with the patient if at all they collapse uh, and continue into the post operative period then uh, over a period of time i realized that uh, and i used to enjoy critical care over a period of time i realized that i cannot uh, give uh, justice to both uh, anesthesia and critical care and i opted uh, to concentrate only on critical care because that used to give me a bigger buzz than uh, than anesthesia and anesthesia in many ways is dependent on another person like the surgeon Uh, and your kind of your timings and everything is dependent on another person whereas in critical care you can be your own master and uh, i i enjoyed that uh, working more closely with the patient and this diagnostic work up and everything so that's the reason why i took critical care and uh, what was the second part of your question uh, the recent trends do you see more women oh definitely going to critical uh, care yes training? definitely like uh, you know as you enter medical school or whatever there's 50 50% uh, male as well as female uh, entering medical school but as you go up the ladder and as you go uh, into specialties you always see a trend of males uh, uh, more males compared to females because of family and other pressures uh, but uh, from where i was earlier uh, until now i see more and more females definitely the proportion of females i did a survey recently and found 40% of females in critical care and 60% of males i think that's a quite a good number we are aiming for 50 50 but 40 60 is quite good i think so i think we are getting thank you thank you ma'am i would now like to introduce uh, dr urvi shukla Uh, ma'am is the hod of intensive care unit in symbiosis uh, hospitals pune under symbiosis international university 
my question to you ma'am is uh, what are the unique ways in which women participate and contribute to healthcare delivery in uh, icus or in uh, areas of uh, emergency and ac acute medicine uh unique ways i would say so i think there has been a very big research recent research that has been published uh, which says that over a period of last 30 years they have seen uh, patients who are being treated by women tend to live better tend to live longer and they have less mishaps when there is a women physician treating these patients and so i see dr shrinivas smiling so i assume he's uh, he's agreeing with me uh so that i think that speaks a lot about our unique traits uh i think what we bring uh, differently to the table is our understanding of how uh socio uh, bio socio psycho psychological dynamics work when a patient comes to us with an illness so we are not just interested in the macro numbers you know what's the heart rate what's the blood pressure what is his uh, pre existing morbidities but we are also interested in why he he or she has gotten to that stage and that makes a lot of difference we take a lot more Uh, um interest in doing preventive work also with not only with the patients but with the families so i think we do that uh, and we may not actually put this out in a protocol in our own icus or emergency departments but this is how i feel women will naturally uh, treat these patients so that makes a lot of difference uh, we don't let our patients leave or go without an adequate information set of information when they are going home or even when they are going to another hospital because we are not able to provide care uh, in our own setup so these are the few things which i feel that that we bring this differently to the care of critically ill patients uh, i do agree with you ma'am and uh, with our uh, unique uh, uh, i mean uh, the traits like creativity in uh, in discussing in communicating empathy soft skills uh, social interactions among the different uh, members of our team caregiver team as well as with the patients relatives i think uh, we do a great job and uh, so uh, next question will be uh, by dr rani hi we have dr vaishali solo uh, who is the director and uh, head of the critical care department at portis uh, mulund mumbai hi ma'am hello uh, thank you thank you for uh, having me yeah you have been in this this for many years just wonder uh, if you could explain how you were balancing work life balance and to do best for both places and sure. your suggestion to other intensivists so i think i come from an era where uh, it wasn't easy for women to be in intensive care so in the beginning i uh, i did not balance i i was extremely focused on my career and uh, i kept on following the career path this is i'm talking of the early 2000 i started my career in 2001 when i reached the peak of my career finished all the trainings that i wanted to that is when i uh, then decided to marry and have a personal life also so yes today it's a much different uh, era and uh, i think it's exciting times to be actually uh, women in medicine today as compared to during my times but uh, it was even, even if it was difficult it was worth it and as uh, sulagna said um, it's good to be in a position where you can inspire your juniors uh, to uh, reach the same levels that you have reached and it's also good to be in a position to make it easier for them so i think as a so having gone through what we have gone through it's our responsibility to see to it that they find it far more easier than us um also um uh, one thing about uh, i want to mention uh, when professor sheela was talking about the posh society uh, so posh committee i was one of the chairman of a posh committee in one of the hospitals and my biggest suggestion was that um, they women are all aware of uh, the posh committee and what they can uh, come to to the posh committee the surprising thing is men are not aware at workplaces so i first suggested give training to the men at workplaces what is appropriate behavior at workplaces because when i questioned one of the cases and i questioned the male counterpart who was the accused 
he said uh, he was he was shocked that how he behaved was uh, unacceptable at workplace this was he was a you know technician but he was uh, very surprised that uh, his behavior you know, was should be and was considered as inappropriate uh, behavior at workplace so i think the biggest uh, um, step to be taken women are all become aware they have become woke uh, it's time to wake up the men and uh, train them about um, what is appropriate workplace behavior in my era i have faced a lot of sexist uh, uh, atmosphere at uh, during my training i'm talking about the first 10 years of 2000 in my workplace and today those uh, that is changing drastically and that's very encouraging and uh, i think uh, that should encourage more and more and that's why probably the representation is going up and um, yes professor sheila has started the trend and i someone said 50 50 i think uh, um, not equality what we deserve. So someday if it becomes 60, 40 towards women, that's also should be welcome because yes, we are worth it. If we are good enough, we should be 60%. Can I just make a comment? Uh, I think sure. uh, Vaishali, you've made some excellent points. And you know, uh, it's of course, uh, you know, men need to be sensitized, but I'll tell you, I was shocked to see that women did not know about the Posh Act. Many women did not know about it. Let's, let's be and, you know, women, uh, you know, sense that this is inappropriate behavior, but they also don't speak up. You know, a lot of women don't speak up. You know, someone says, hey, you're looking beautiful. You know, something like, you know, they don't speak up if they feel it's inappropriate, but they sense that it's inappropriate. So I think, you know, this kind of sensitization is required not only for men, but even for women. You know, unless you talk about it, you speak about it. Like, you know, in my hospital, we don't even have a posh committee. We have something for harassment and what but it's not a posh committee so i think you know we have a long way to go with you know uh this so it's it's a it's a great uh i think it's a it's a first step i can just say that i agree yes but sometimes men take some comments and behaviors as something which is absolutely acceptable and uh not realizing that at workplace it is completely unacceptable and inappropriate and uh, he was completely cough, caught uh, off guard and uh, he said, I didn't even realize that uh, such a comment uh, would be uh, inappropriate. So that's when I suggested to the institution and they got a lot of training done for uh, men um, and uh, soft skills and what is considered appropriate and what is considered inappropriate. A small comment um, can be um, can be in today's uh, circumstances be uh, politically and uh, rightly so incorrect. And so the men need to be trained now. Uh, women also should be made aware, of course, and I think these youngsters are very brave, the young girls, they come forward, they complain. Um, uh, it's the men who are currently uh, not aware that they have to have uh, follow a certain protocol, and their awareness also has to be, uh, you know, sort of uh, boosted, otherwise they land in trouble. This guy, he thought it was innocent what he did and uh, but he landed in trouble because uh, some, I mean those comments probably uh, even on the road today should not be accepted but yes it's accepted on the road but uh, at workplace uh, he made those comments and uh, he landed in big trouble and despite being very good at his work actually so I think both uh, women uh, need to come forward and uh, men also uh, need to know the boundaries at workplace uh, defined boundaries. And yes, uh, I mean, uh, at least in the private sector, every hospital now has a posh committee and uh, that's mandatory for all private setups to have posh committees. And it's essential that every female employee should be aware of their rights to go to the posh committee uh, with uh, whatever uh, uh, experience they face if they think it's discrimination. Can I ask a question, Vaishali? No? Sure. Um, uh, that ex that uh, reminded me of that uh, football coach who kissed the... <laughs> football, yes. female footballer yes. on the list and thought yes. it was a compliment, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, so uh, I just want to ask you, uh, you uh, said you reached the zenith of your uh, achievements in critical care and then got married. Do you think yeah. it was, uh, was the reason to delay marriage uh, your career choice in critical care and the fact that you thought that you couldn't achieve both uh, and so you had to complete whatever you had to before you got married. So I think it was complex during my uh, days. I come from a second tier city, Nagpur. For uh, me to be able to pursue critical care, I had to migrate to Mumbai. And uh, without any social support, uh, you know, as a stranger, when I came to Mumbai in 2001, 
And then uh, I realized that my passion is critical care and uh, I decided to pursue it with a single-minded focus. And I knew uh, at, in those days uh, that if I divert my focus uh, towards marriage or kids, I won't be able to, um, you know, I'm, I'm a very focused person when I do anything. <laughs> I probably it's, it's not nothing to do with female or male. I'm just probably that personality. And I decided to uh, focus a lot. But yes, there was a huge, uh, uh, this in my fear, in my mind, that if I do uh, get married, uh, I may not be able to focus as much. And that was that would have been the reality, actually. That does happen. Uh, what I feel today has happened is um, there is a liberty uh, women have today to uh, slow down if you have uh, kids. And your career doesn't take a major hit uh, today. Uh, it might just be a step back, but you again start the onward journey. I wasn't too confident that would happen uh, in, in that era when I uh, was pursuing my career. So yes, um, one was the circumstances that I had to leave my family, friend and fa family support and migrate to a completely new city, which today, again, the second tier cities are offering such good, uh, you know, um, uh, job opportunities that most of my students now, DNB or IDCCM, they get trained and they're going back to their cities, Nasek, Nagpur, wherever they're coming from. I didn't have that opportunity uh, during my time. So, um, and plus I wanted to go abroad also to pursue some training. So there was definitely, uh, I knew that I wouldn't be able to do it with so much focus. Uh, and so, uh, yes, that is how my life uh, shaped. No regrets, I must say. We will make the choice, as Professor Sheila said. If you make a choice to work in intensive care, give your whole to intensive care. Then don't complain that I have to go in the night or I have to sit there for four hours in the night. You made a choice. Choose and then follow it through with full dedication without complaining and asking for SOPs just because uh, you are a female. So no regrets, but it was it was difficult in my time. And I'm happy that it is not so difficult now. I see so many of my students balancing both, um, of course, with the support of their uh, of their partners and also with the support of the family. So these are exciting times for women, no doubt. Um, I just I just want to make a point. Uh, you said some very nice uh, points. I just want to say something. You know, unfortunately uh, for women, Everything kind of comes together when you're doing this. I'm sure all of you have faced it because, you know, just at the time you're getting that dream job of yours is the time you're either getting married or having a baby and everything comes together at the same time. And it makes such so difficult for a woman to balance all this becomes extremely difficult. And it is a short period of her time. A woman mm -hmm. spends less than five years of her life after having children or getting married. It's a short phase in your life. And what you're often worried about, especially with ambitious career-oriented women is, will I lose out if I have a baby? Will I lose out if I have? And that is the time when you really need the support. You know, you need that support. And I've seen this because we have our DM critical care program and I encourage more and more women are coming forward. And I say, you know, don't worry. We will support you. Don't worry. Have a baby. Do this. You know, you need some support from your employer at that time. It's not a permanent thing that all along she's going to be like that. And, you know, when you support a woman during that period, she will work harder. She will give back more to you. You know, so I think somewhere because, you know, you can't get over the thing of motherhood or all the family and social responsibilities that a woman does have to attend to. So I think the as employers, because we are now employers of many uh, female intensivists, and this is not only a labor intensive, uh, this thing, it requires a, a lot of any any job where a woman has to work as a, uh, you know, as a, as a physician is demanding. So I, I believe now that, you know, you, you have to support them a bit and then make sure that they compensate when, you know, with their male counterparts. It should not just be, oh, I'm a woman, I need time off for this, I need time. It should be fair. It should be equitable for everybody. That's thank that's you, ma'am. I've done. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to add, ma'am, here something. Dr. Vani, uh, Professor Manimala Rao, madam, wants to uh, <laughs> say something. We would listen to her. Okay. She's one of the pioneers, one of the earliest uh, people who actually made a name for critical care in the country. We will listen good to her. Good evening, ma'am. Yeah, good evening, ma'am. Yeah, please. Good evening. good evening, everybody. As usual, I forgot to say, was. So suddenly I realized. I have not come in here. So I thought I'll just say hi to everybody. A very happy time in your life and progress. And I don't know, when you ask that, uh, did you have troubles? Yes, all of us go through troubles as a mother, as a parent, as a you know, a person who is pursuing 
your goals in life as a doctor, as a professional. But I think uh, women are fairly strong, I think, at least. So they can do the multitasking. And I think they can sort of uh, make it happen. This is what I always thought. But of course, you need your partner's support or the way you've been brought up when you are younger. That is what makes it. Because I did, I did have both those things. My parents as well as my partner never said, don't do this or don't do that. And that way. But of course, as a mother, I had to do a lot. The baby I had, at 24 days, I had to go back to work. Nowadays, you have six months maternity. I think that's more than enough to come back. I think so. Unless you had some complications or something like that, that's a different thing. But I think we have to make it in our mind if we want to do something really good. And you are that is your where your heart is. And you have to work for it. Whether you are a woman or a man, I don't think there is. Yeah, please go ahead. Tell what do you want to say. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so say. much. I want Thank to you. add something, ma'am, here. Uh, Shella, ma'am, rightly said, ma'am, we are the employers now. I have a consultant right now with me. She's breastfeeding her child. I have kept her on the morning duties, no night duties, so that she can breastfeed her child. So we can make flexible schedules for them. And I have a, uh, I had the, the consultant, she was about to proceed for the maternity leave in the terminal stages of her pregnancy. I also kept her in the morning duties so that she, in any case, she can be more comfortable while 8 to 5 job or 9 to 5 job rather than on the night duty. So as being employer of uh, now being in the position, we can make flexible schedules for the females. Though we can say they cannot be off the duties, but yes, flexible schedules as compared to male counterparts or otherwise also, ma'am. Both ways we can do that, I suppose. Thank you. Uh, so we now move on to our next panelist, uh, Dr. Yadarilang Tisho. Uh, Madam is an associate professor in general medicine in Negrim's uh, Institute, Shillong. And uh, Madam, my question to you is, uh, after fulfilling so much uh, uh, regarding our profession, regarding family, so much demand, so many roles which are demanding. So how do we take care of our health? What is your advice for all the women out here? So how do we take care of ourselves? So first and foremost, uh, thank you all for inviting me to this wonderful webinar. Uh, so this is a very important um, issue that we have to address actually at this uh, point uh, in this present era. As you, as we all see, we all tend to forget about our health. We only remember about the health of others. But as they always say, if we cannot take care of ourselves, how can we take care of others? So this is one point which I would like to emphasize that no matter how busy we are in a schedule, we should always remember that we have to take care of our health, both physically, mentally, and socially. And uh, we have seen now in this present era uh, that very young people are suffering from uh, lifestyle diseases. And this is taken the toll, especially in the medical fraternity. We're seeing young cardiologists dying because of a heart attack for which very few of us will expect such a patient will uh, have uh, such an event. So I feel like if we take care of ourselves, both physically, mentally and socially, we can address uh, our uh, professional life and even our social life uh, in a better way. So... Uh, me as a consultant, yes, uh, we are in. I'm in charge. I'm one of the in charge of the ICU. We have a medicine ICU, fifteen beds, and we usually divide our duties uh, accordingly. And uh, I always emphasize. And uh, right now, I've made it a practice that I always uh, uh, spend one hour of physical activity for myself. And along with that, I usually engage right now before when I was studying, I never had time for all these physical activities, going to the gym or for swimming, or uh, some basketball uh, games. But now I've realized that with this changing world, uh, we need to give time to ourselves. So by giving time up to ourselves, we get more energy, both mentally and physically, to give further time to others. So I would like to emphasize to all the medical fraternity, please don't forget about our health. That is the most important thing. Then only we can take care of our profession and even our family in a better way. Thank you, ma'am. I think this is more applicable during our residency programs. 
we nice use we have day night off shifts in a continuation of months so uh, i myself have faced uh, you know I, i i had sleep disorders and i had problems of frequ- memory and uh, i had i i, I accompanied also i had anxiety with it what i am doing or you know how my health is going to deteriorate so i think our residents the junior people that who are in training we need to you know support them actively and also need to take active care of their how they are dealing with their health issues i would so, like to put a questions to our uh, seniors ma'am do we feel that like we should emphasize among our junior doctors that like they should spend some time uh, in the form of physical activity uh at least uh, one uh, four times in a week uh, that should be uh, emphasized among our um, medical forces should we put that into practice among our medical forces workforce because i feel personally i feel it does helps it does sharpen our mindset it, it also gives us more physical energy to do our work uh, this is from my personal experience uh, i i just like to come in and say definitely we should but again uh, we can't uh, you know force anyone to do it we must encourage people and also to do it you need some time so you have to you know sometimes you have so many uh, day night duties that you all you have time for is to sleep so we also have to think about we also been through that so let's be a little more humane let's give some you know we can you know work out some time more for them sometimes you can give them a little more time off so that whatever it may not be some physical activity maybe music maybe just yoga maybe whatever they like to do dancing or whatever mm-hmm. but they should like you rightly said make time for uh, you know not only physical but also their mental and social well being i think that's uh, really really important but we should actively encourage it uh can i say something i think hello Yeah. Yes. Uh, uh you know um like when I worked in UK we have a, a European working time directive so nobody can work more than so many hours in a week and they employ that many people in order to fulfill all those time slots. Uh but in India we don't have that it's whether it is man or woman you know and uh, people are expected to just work and stay over over time and then continue to uh you know stay back and all that kind of thing but uh in uk where i work you work come in the morning and go when your shift ends you just leave and go it should be something like that so if it is a shift system or whichever system it is you have a you have time for work and you have time for play and that has to be incorporated whether it is man or woman anyone we not be mindful in I that think... but uh, definitely we can at least make our individual efforts to ensure more work like well balance for our colleagues and our juniors yes ma'am i think uh, nowadays even in india most of the hospitals they are going for shift systems so yeah. at least the youngsters they get some time for themselves to do workouts or go to gym or time for their family i think compared to what it was i think it's getting better even in india that's what i feel Yes, Th- thank you now uh, now we have uh, dr vanila chopra uh, she is a uh, hod critical care at narayana super specialty hospital jammu uh, hi there uh, hi, i have ma'am. a question for you like uh, uh, all of us at time to time sometimes we do feel low and we underestimate ourselves what sometimes call uh, imposter syndrome so uh, why do you think women are more prone to imposter syndrome and how do we overcome that uh, thanks lakshmi ma'am ma'am i think we all uh, in the era where male dominance is more in the medical fraternity we all must have felt at any point of time with this so called the imposter syndrome I am basically an anesthesiologist. Uh, I have practiced anesthesia for 13 years at in a duo combination. Then I shifted over to intensive care. Initially, when I was when I joined this institution, Narayana Health, so there was team of all male doctors. There was no no one was female. So initially, to be in that uh, situation, everybody obviously tried to overpower you, to demean you, whether you have some knowledge of the like fraternity or not or whatsoever, especially in a domain where all males are the primaries, the cardiologists, the nephrologists and all. But 
I think slowly over the time, uh, they just get to know that you're not a vessel of beauty only. You have brains also, you have knowledge, you have skills also. And obviously, gradually, they come to know about it. And once you start reciprocating, uh, obviously, the treatment, the end results of the patients, and uh, how you communicate with them, with the attendants also, and how you tide over the emergency situations and handle the situations, I think that has all added. And now I think... Uh, it has uh, like in a bit yes definitely yes at any point of time it was there but for a short duration must say but with all these things with your knowledge skills upgrading yourself routinely and uh, communicating communication is a basic thing i think one should uh, open up with your ideas of what you are thinking what your differential diagnosis is and what the other primary or the the attendants have the expectation. So once you communicate, communication is a basic skill, I think. And that has uh, led me to tide over this imposter syndrome. Yes, uh, as work-life balance, I would say, uh, again, uh, a cup of coffee with my female colleagues, with my female friends, or anything which boosts my energy, which boosts, uh, which bring positivity in my life. Maybe a little chat with my spouse or anything. Uh, a workplace anything it can obviously it can lead to little bit of less of imposter syndrome and uh, definitely attached to your positive energy in your life ma'am can i add a comment sure ma'am yeah sure uh, yeah so uh, uh, this the imposter syndrome reminds me of one anecdote that i had read some time back uh, so it was about deal gayam uh, he was a, he is an author and uh, he was uh, attending one party, uh, a gathering rather, of researchers, scientists, and many great people who had made and discovered things. He felt very small in that gathering. So he went to the end, to the back of the whole hall and stood there. There he found another uh, gentleman who was also standing there, you know, away from all the hustle bustle and the discussions that were carrying on. So they both got chatting. He realized that the other gentleman was also Neil. And that other gentleman said that, uh, you know, I when I see this crowd, I feel, uh, what the heck am I doing here? I mean, these people have made things. And I was just, I just went where I was sent. So fortunately, that was Neil Armstrong who made, who said this. And uh, so Neil Gaiman said that if anybody, uh, if a person who has been, he's the only man to walk on the moon or the first man to walk on the moon, feels like an imposter in this gathering, then I'm sure all of us have felt an imposter at some point in our life. So I think it's not gender specific. Uh, yeah. All of us will feel out of depth in some or the other situation. And I feel that the we need to have, I mean, we are what we are and we are there because of the certain qualities that we get there and not necessarily how qualified or how, uh, you know, maybe superior that we feel we are uh, as compared to others. So I think this imposter syndrome is pretty gender neutral uh, right now. But yes, women tend to feel it more often because of the challenges that they have faced during their lives and their careers. So, uh, but... I just want to add one point here that you're, you're right, both men and women experience imposter syndrome. But in the critical care community, you know, when we are a minority, sometimes it's probably felt more by women, especially like Vanilla rightly said, you know, surrounded by men and you, you, you know, you kind of question yourself, am I going to be that competent? Am I going to, am I going to be convinced them that I'm good at this? So, you know, you do in that kind of situation, uh, have this uncertainty, uncertainty yeah. but so specific to critical care i would say where there are less women and there are probably the chairs and everything is male so that that can be more likely likely happening with women true ma'am it's the confidence and taking the positive feedback as a compliment and also accept our gaps and enthusiasm to learn all these will get you overcome this imposter uh, so my thank next you, question, thank you, uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, my next question to Dr. Uh, Sama Begum. Uh, sir, uh, you have worked in different countries and different continents, and uh, so you can you tell us what are the trends at the global global level nowadays? And uh, sir, have you uh, come across your colleagues in different countries who have had the uh, you know the mm, Due to the situation, they had to either change their profession or change their speciality because of the demands of their career. So, what what has been your experience regarding your female colleagues in the different um, uh, situations? So, so, 
as far as uh, uh, the gender related uh, you know uh, patterns and acceptance and behavior is concerned i think we are very well far behind uh, the europeans and the australians um the equality there is something you need to see to believe uh, which i personally believe is the way it should be uh, every individual uh, whether you are a male female or whatever uh, it is your competence your skills and your confidence in what you know that should determine where you want to be and how aggressive you want to be in your profession and that's what i i noticed and i appreciated uh both in the in the united in the uk as well as in australia um it is coming in india as well now um, as vaishali was saying compared to what it was when we were training about 20 25 years ago the situation is much different now uh, the younger intensivists are much more confident the younger intensivists are much more self assured so you need to grow out of that thought process am i good enough for this you are coming into this field because you are good enough you need to have the self confidence in yourself that's what i found um, uh, abroad when i was there uh, they used to be so confident of them that they will stand their own against uh, uh, any kind of scrutiny and any kind of challenges they face and that's what i am seeing currently um, here as well just to take uh, it why i smiled when the purvi said uh, very intensive is safer intensive is i am personal witness to that um in a in a team of four consultants i'm the only male in my team and i have an excellent step to record <laughs> so hey that 25% unsafe practices must be coming from me is what i think it is uh, so i agree with uh, and i personally believe um that um, the the competence the skills and the confidence of the individual is all what matters um this is an opportune opportune time for us because Uh, as uh, we we just released the position statement on uh, balance and equality and all that and this is the time when some of the committees of the society are being reconstituted um and it is an opportunity for us at the leadership to walk the talk um and ensure it's not it's not reservation please don't get me wrong uh, it is just an extraordinary effort we need to make uh, to find those unsung uh, people uh both male and female who have been working hard for the society over the past few years who haven't got the visibility and to bring them to the forefront and in doing so um it's my endeavor it will be my endeavor as well as uh, dr vadip bhattacharya and my uh, people who follow me subsequently to ensure that the 37 point something percentage of women representatives of the society get their due in all the committees if you would see as you will see in subsequent days uh whether it is the uh, electoral board of the uh, critical care communications whether it is the webinars that we do or even the scientific committee for the next year's conference we will make an all out effort just to say that iscm just doesn't publish papers and put them on the website uh, the leadership is convinced of what they are talking and we will walk the talk uh if i may just come in so i think shrivas is being very modest very modest uh, errors uh, errors have- Twenty-five percent, and uh, one, and, uh, one eight, which is eight, very, which is very important, and very encouraging coming from a male colleague, is that let's walk the talk. So let the position statements not be there just as they are, but they should we should walk the talk and follow them. And I'm really happy because both the males and the females through consensus did not vote for any quota, which is right because as you know, as intensivists. as a female intensivist i don't think i'm any inferior to my male counterpart yes. i don't think i need any reservation i don't think like you know i need any quota because i think in fact dr manimala rao's made a very nice point that women as multitaskers probably you know we have more empathy we are more human probably why that paper showed uh, better outcome so we are as good as our male counterparts we just need uh, you know i think more encouragement to come into these positions and that is why even in electoral positions there was no talk about any quota for women or anything like that but definitely we know that there is a problem you see in conferences how many manels we have manel is a panel of only males we have made sure that we will not have any manels and we will have you know uh, at least one woman in every session it should not be a all male thing and it, it happens very subconsciously it is not by design but these things have to change so we do know that there is a problem we identify that despite the fact that we don't try to you know go there and make some gender disparity there is a problem the representation of women are less 
so you know rather than have quotas we should have some targets i believe that we should have some targets okay if it is 5% now let's try to make it better let's try to make it better over the years so i i believe more in targets so starting an issm position statement having a, is is one one step forward and probably if the leadership going forward at least in the nominated position has a representation in proportion to the membership of the society i think that's a fair way going forward and then, you know when you see more and more women coming forward you see what dynamic and what capable women we have in the society we just have to find those women and we have to bring them forward and then once we bring them forward they will definitely shine uh, where they are and that is my real hope if i can leave as a past president with this thing that definitely we'd see more dynamic women giving being given an opportunity and then they'll definitely shine so your words are very encouraging uh, dr shrinivas unfortunately dr pradeep is not there but i'm sure he shares the same uh, view that you you do for nominated positions whether it's a journal newsletter uh, all the position uh, uh, committees conferences you know we can have that kind of representation it will be great thank you yeah, manimala ma'am uh, i think wants to add something uh, ma'am can you please okay hey, because i have worked at the time i think i was the only woman but there were all men around but i didn't feel scared so it is your confidence and your knowledge and your communication your system and your discipline nobody can say no to you go ahead do the best and that's what i tell everybody because these are communication is very important the way you communicate we need not be egoistic but we have to get everybody to the table to talk is there a problem can we solve it so that used to be my way of dealing because i had so many of them when i went to conferences but i got every time every conference till this last conference i have attended with only the lady president i didn't get a <laughs> sorry sheila just I a joke program, madam. so i couldn't come for that <laughs> i didn't get the program so, sorry <laughs> no, no i just just I was joking so i'm just saying that they have always invited me. i was there in at least two or three you know places where they have given me so that is not it is the women who have to search for it. yes the men will also give you once you are good at it so don't fear that what i am doing is it you know worry sometimes i feel that even i when i see the a uh, student who comes to me in the beginning both men and women both of them they don't like to talk but it is you who make them talk and slowly they come out and then you see the best in them that is what happens so the more women there will be more women in that uh, you know areas it will come so now i think in anesthesia critical care even in surgery there are women now i see all girls only everywhere in medicine right. so it will become another russia i think there could not be many men because it takes a long time to achieve men have to have a quick team and they are wanting to go to other places or maybe you are treating them there so i feel that when you you can do so much of how you are bringing up children bear the pain what is this you know i mean you may think but i think it is all in you if you want to i told you those five or six things you have to be disciplined you can't come late you have to be systematic you have to see that things are put in place you have to be communicative so that nobody gets and you have to oversee everything okay fast tag means what have you seen it that's what i said in that right so in this way if you have got these five six qualities and you have to be a good administrator you have to be a good researcher you have to be everything more into one so anybody who has those they cannot stop you women or men i mean this is my thinking but it will come to you for all of you also because you are all doing well and that's why you are here talk okay all the best uh, i just glad that madam has been such an in her era if she could do it uh, when it was such a male dominated society i mean she is such an inspiration for us because you know it's much easier now for all of us someone in the chat has asked uh, that please provide the document these position statements are on the iccm website under about us 
and uh, it will also be published shortly in the Indian Journal of Critical Care Medicine. Thank okay, you, ma'am. Uh, Thank you. There I is think... a question. There's a question on the chat box. Um, I think as a busy consultant, how do you support and guide your children's education? There's a question on the chat box. So anyone can answer. Anyone? Maybe the moderators can answer. Yeah, uh, I have three children. Uh, uh, and uh, when they were kids, uh, my middle son is autistic. And uh, his education, like, despite being a busy consultant or busy person at that time, I might have not been a consultant, but despite being whoever I am, my first priority was always my children. So when you have that in mind, you uh, focus on them, you know, uh, you you do your work, but then when home time is home time and work time is work time, I usually try not to bring uh, work home or, you know, settle all the dues in the workplace and come home and concentrate on the children. And it's very difficult to bring up, bring up an autistic almost non-verbal child who gets violent meltdowns and things like that. Uh, but I, I'm happy to say I've done, I try to get into his brain and figure out how he uh, requires to study. I used to convert all his text into PowerPoint presentations to teach him because I know he's a visual learner. And, uh, uh, and I'm happy to say that, you know, I've fought for him throughout his schooling and adulthood and now he's finished 10th 12th standard and his BA animation and graphic designing and MA animation so and he's got a job now uh, and uh, you know uh, it requires a lot of effort and a lot of uh, and and I even though I have my husband is there to support him I'm the only one who can actually calm him down when he has a meltdown so uh and I've also been the main person teaching my other two children as well. Uh, my uh, my husband does a lot of uh, supporters supports us in many ways, and but he doesn't uh, look after the uh, studies of the children. And that's all been my uh, headache. But I found that when women go through such a lot of hardship and uh, they have to do things, I found that all my achievements practically 100% of my achievements and all my learning and my higher education, like for example, my FRCA degree, my uh, CCT, my uh, EDIC, everything what I have achieved is after I have had children. Because I know that if I fail an exam, it's going to affect my family. I know that if I spend too much time studying, it's going to affect my family. So I have just... I have like razor sharp focus on whatever I have to do and just achieve it and get it out of the way. And somehow or the other, doing that over a period of time, I have, uh, you know, passed exams and uh, done things and recognitions have come automatically. Money has come automatically. I've not you know, worked for, towards that. But uh, but because of the children, I think I, I am a better uh, person at the workplace and I can maintain a work-life balance. The more difficulties you have, you just become more good at what you can do. I just, uh, firstly, hats off to Neeta. I had the interaction. Uh, 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 I think it's amazing. I, think it's amazing. Uh, 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 I just want to I say, want to say point I want to, I want to make, make a lot of class how you Family, critical care, and I think intrinsically, as we are really resilient, I feel our profession, especially critical care, helps you multitask quite a bit. And you know, uh, like Anita very rightly said, you know, when you know, you know, family is most important, and you have to do this, you do the things faster, better, more efficiently because you want to make time for your children, you want to go home and be there for them, you want to. So you know, you somehow you kind of train yourself to be more efficient. But all this requires a lot of hard work because without hard work, you cannot maintain that balance. You can only be good then at one thing. So, uh, uh, you know, I really feel that there is no substitute for hard work. If you want to maintain a good balance between family, children, work and all this, this is my personal experience.
Yeah, I would like to add to this, uh, Nita, uh, amazing story that story you mentioned that you here. Mentioned here. Uh, uh, I just want, I just to, want add to add that when kids are in school, uh, you really need to choose your battles wisely. So if the focus is first rank, then you'll probably be burning your candle at both ends. But if the focus is literacy, numeracy, and you know, making them read differently or making them read outside of the curriculum, then things become a little more interesting because they find you more fun rather than when you just go home and say, Aaj maths mein kitna kiya or biology mein kya sikhaya, and they will stop talking to you. So what uh, for me, it has been slightly easy because my husband looks after the education of the kids. But I also make it a point that the first thing I don't, uh, when I reach home is I don't ask whether they have done their math homework or whether they've done their chemistry or, you know, did they get any remarks in the calendar today or stuff like that? Because it just, I think it's more important to have a relationship with your children rather than just running behind the marks. And I feel we are all genetically quite uh, intelligent. So some of you, we'll have to trust our genes, right? I mean, they will get transmitted. So it, it works out well in the end. <laughs> sure. Dr. Srinivas, can I talk for a minute? Yeah, yeah, please, ma'am. Yeah, like as Dr. Anita, George, and Urvi Shukla, they all said, uh, I had a quite difficult time when I moved back from England with one school-going kid and one baby and uh, looking after them and getting them used to this system here was very difficult task. And at the same time, new environment to me new place, new workplace. So uh, quite stressful, but with the support of the department, with the support of your colleagues, uh, I managed to do. But in fact, I used to bring my little one when I had to come for night call. Uh, and uh, I used to, I used to keep one housekeeping, just keep an eye on him and uh, let me just go and do the rounds or see the sick patient or do the case something like that I used to do. And uh, I should say I couldn't go for more than one day workshop or CME. Uh, I, I couldn't go for conferences for three, four days because there are no facilities to look after them. And I couldn't go. And I uh, when Dr. Mohan, my boss here, Mohan Maharaj, he went for IDCM in Chennai, but he asked me, do you want to go somewhere and do the fellowship or do something? I said, no, my kids are first priority, so I need to settle them. So I couldn't go anywhere in India. Though I did FRCA in England, I couldn't go. But now they are settled. My daughter did master's in Europe and my son is doing economics graduation. Now I feel, no, I should learn. I should go and do something. Maybe it's a bit late, but uh, I feel never too late to learn new things. Very good. <laughs> Thank you for Thank that. Thank you for that. Now, now like I feel like sorry, it's sorry, it's going, going. Um, we are already running uh, late of stipulated time. We just have a couple of questions. I want all the panelists to give a quick answer to this question. question like, 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 how can, how can women, women empower the work? women at workplace or the men empower women at workplace? That's for that's a Vedam. So, yeah, all of you can give a quick thing what we can do about it. Okay, I'll, okay, go, first I'll then. go first then. So, I think, so I what, think women what women ask, ask is not. Uh, you know, SOPs or like Dr. Vaishali had mentioned that it is not just about giving, it is just about letting them uh, some space uh, in the department. And I'm sure we all can do that. So space in the in terms of opportunities, space, space in terms of, you know, giving them a, 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 a time to talk about their difficulties, space in terms of allowing them to take some special leaves in cases uh, in certain situations and space in terms of just allowing them to be. And, uh, you know, uh, maybe taking them in as equal in a genuine sense of the way, not just uh, glossy terms, but just allowing them. And 
in actions telling them that you are an appreciated member of this uh, team. And I think that's all we need to do. Uh, if I may come in, I just want to add. So it's, you know, to a lot of time, the representation of women coming forward, even in a city like Mumbai, where we have a DM program is, is, you know, quite restricted. And I used to always wonder why is that? Because all of them go through this competitive exam. They're really smart students, but you'll see the women are not really coming forward. So, you know, now I've changed your approach. I just want to give you an example. So whenever I have a research project or a study, a study, and I go forward to, you know, I have maybe two women in the team and I have uh, six males in the team and I say, who would like to do this? All the males say, yes, I want to do it. None of the women come forward, okay? And all of them say yes. And whenever I've offered to them, it to them, they have not really delivered. But they all say yes first. I want to do it. I want to do it. I want to do it, okay? Now I've changed my approach a bit and I go up to the women and say, why are you not coming forward, you know? So they say, no, I'm not sure whether I will be able to have the time I'm not sure whether, you know, so women don't just say, it's just by nature, they don't just say, yes, I'll do it unless they are, you know, confident that they'll be able to give the time that they will be able to, you know, deliver or they have the aptitude. Whereas I, this is just my observation that, you know, uh, many times males would say yes and they would put their names in. So now I've changed the approach. I said, I go up to the female and say, uh, female intensivist and say, come, why don't you come forward? Don't worry. I will help you. I will support you. And I have noticed that whenever I've included a woman in this kind of project, you know, she gets that confidence initially where she has this kind of imposter syndrome uh, that, you know, Dr. Vanila very beautifully talked about. And then once she gets into that, she becomes so confident that she's leading all the other these things, you know. So you have to kind of not just give equal opportunities, but you have to bring them forward. Women have to start mentoring women. Say, come forward. I'll help you. Women sponsoring women, women mentoring women is really, really important. Not just saying I'll give you and not just lip service, you know. And I noticed that whenever I have given that opportunity and supported them, they have actually performed better. Really, they have performed better because they've done a very sincere job. But they need that initial push, that initial confidence, which, you know, by naturally, we don't really just take part. I, I, I'm sure you all understand because we've all been in that kind of uh, situation, you know. So we have to be a little sensitive about this and, you know, try to sponsor more women and try to bring them forward, you know, encourage them and say, because, you know, we are, we all serve as role models and we are naturally selected women who are very tough and have come forward. So I think we are in the perfect position to make this change for our younger colleagues, right? And give them a better, uh, better position than what we were in in that situation this is this is what i would do just want to share that with you i think ma'am holding ma hands with your junior consultants also the junior colleagues also make a long way come forward for them also and obviously as you said rightly just uh, Prozahit Kana is very big thing for them because nobody has ever made them come forward for that thing. They have always been at the back end, in the home, uh, in the profession, also always taking a back end. You have to take care of the children, the family. So profession has never taken a forefront for them. So once you hold hands with them and you bring them forward like you can do it, definitely they come forward and with a more zeal zeal and zeal they come forward and do it in a better way. They are more diligent, more disciplined. Multitasker, they are very superb. They are multitaskers. So definitely if we hold hands as a senior faculty to them, they will definitely do better in their job profiles. So definitely. Can I go next? Can I go next? Yeah. yeah. So just, so quickly, just quickly, I think, uh, uh, you know, the, the, we need to, we push, need to the push the women confident. Just confident. yesterday, 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 yesterday I interviewed a uh, female uh, candidate and I realized that uh, when it and this is a very, uh, very huge reality. And all I'm sure all the panelists will agree uh, with me on this, that we don't we don't negotiate well. We don't ask for what we are worth of, uh, you know, yes. in the private sector. If you see there is no parity between um, uh, the uh, female and male intensivists, how much uh, they are getting. And I'm, I know I'm, um, you know, uh, broaching a very sensitive topic over here, but that's a reality. And uh, we all know this. I have learned it the hard way to actually ask for what I'm worth. Uh, I didn't in the beginning. There's no doubt the first 10 to 15 years, I was like, uh, you know, just this this girl gave me the same answer. I told them, Madam, I told them, you tell me how much and then I'll think about it. And you see the male candidates, they come for the interview. They start high here. And I'm like, what are you basing your, uh, you know, estimation on? 
So this uh, inherent uh, hesitation, which women have in asking for what they are worth, um, and especially this I'm talking in terms of uh, the financial uh, 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 compensations that they get. This is where I now tend to support women and I tell them when they go for the interview with the HR, ask for what do you think you're worth? Do your research in the market. What does this position get in most of the, in the private uh, setups? Do your research properly, be well informed, and then ask for what you're worth. Because I know her skills are good. She was working with me a few years ago, and I know her skills are excellent. But uh, very poor negotiating skills. And so I feel um, it is our responsibility as those who have gone through and suffered the, uh, the lack of those skills to inculcate them into our juniors. So that, uh, because at certain stage it hurts. Well, once you reach 15, 20 years and you realize that you are sometimes better, you're working harder, and then you open your eyes and you see around that, oh, I was undervaluing myself at least uh, when it comes to the financial remuneration. So I think uh, in that aspect, I tend to uh, tell my uh, trainees and all those who come for interviews to uh, not undervalue themselves. Women tend to do that, female candidates. And on, in the opposite end, some male candidates tend to overvalue themselves also. Um, so it's, it's, it, it is just the uh, natural uh, level of confidence uh, each of the, each gender has. But I think women need to come out of that uh, lack of confidence and ask for what they are worth. And we need to um, encourage them to value themselves first and then ask for their worth. So we come to the last question of our discussion. Uh, I would like to put this question to Samavedam sir and also to other panelists uh, as to how can we ensure that the, uh, the recommendations that will be coming from uh, societies like ICCM about their position statement on DAEI or other uh, national and international bodies, how can we ensure that we um, enact these uh, recommendations and uh, you know actually execute uh, and and see that these are being complied with in the different corporate as well as the government institutions. How can we go so, forward so, with this? So um, something having something on paper is only ten percent of the job. Right? Having something on paper and something on the website is only ten percent of the job. After that, the remaining 90% involves an individual mental uh, acknowledgement that this is something that is needed. Second, as an individual society, our all uh, branches need to be uh, in sync with what we are talking. And three, as a collaborative effort, we need to take, we need to be an example. The Indian Society of Critical Care Medicine needs to be an example to other similar professional bodies. So when it comes to an individual level, as a team leader, as a decision maker, as an employer of intensivists, we should all stop seeing a person as a male or a female. We should see, st start seeing people as intensivists and qualified specialists. The day we make that change in our mind, half the problem is solved. You know, you, if somebody comes to you with an FNB in critical care, you see that FNB in critical care in its entirety. You don't see whether it's a lady candidate with an FNB or a male candidate with an FNB, and you value the degree, not the gender of the person who's carrying the paper, right? So that mindset has to change amongst all the leaders, all the team leaders, and all those prospective employers of individuals who are coming. Second, this gender, uh, this position statement um, has to be circulated, and we should encourage all the branches the branch secretaries, branch chairpersons to have a local meeting like this. This is a national webinar. They should have a local meeting and at least in every local meeting of any other uh, topic, they may be talking about sepsis, they may be talking about hemodynamic instability. Somebody, the branch secretary or the chairperson should actually mention that this is an initiative of the Indian Society of Critical Care Medicine. This is the statement and doesn't cost much money to circulate a print copy of this to all those who are attending. That way, over a period of a year or a couple of years, you keep doing this again and again, majority of the members would know that this is reality and you need to be up to speed with this just as you practice guidelines and you practice evidence-based medicine. This is also evidence-based practice of professionalism in intensive care. So that's another thing. Third thing is 
having had a dynamic lady president uh, now, uh, the ISCCM should lead the way in having a collaborative meeting or a collaborative webinar with other societies like the physician, the anesthesiologist, uh, the cardiac anesthesiologist, the pediatricians together and then talk about how they are going about achieving gender equality in their societies and how the ISCCM is going about uh, doing it. We may have a lot of positives. They may have a lot of positives. We may learn from them and they may learn from us. If that happens, the workplace in a hospital becomes a much more balanced, much more pleasant atmosphere for everybody to work rather than having conflicts and approaching past conflicts. This is my perspective. If I may just add, very well said, uh, Dr. Srinivas, and it's so encouraging to see that the future leadership will take this forward. And like rightly said, only 10% of the work is having the statements. So it is a big step. Uh, I am only aware of one or two societies who even have a statement like this. So uh, as he rightly said, firstly, it's put on our website so that people will read it. But how many people are actually going to the website? So if all of you see this and disseminate it in your branches and can be taken forward, it will be a huge step. But having said that, whenever you have this kind of position statement, it's a position statement. It's not a law. So, you know, no one is, uh, you know, uh, sort of forced to follow it. And whenever you thrust something on people, their first uh, response is always to reject it. Why the hell should I follow this? You know, why should I do this? So what's very important is like webinars like this, you know, you sensitize people that, yes, there is a problem. And we have not talked, you know, the title is gender balance. It doesn't say male or female. It's about maintaining the balance. And we know that at the moment there is a bit of imbalance and, we, imbalance and we're trying to maintain that balance. So I think first you have to have more buy-in from people. You have to sensitize people and people have to understand and acknowledge that there is a problem. Once they understand that, and it's not just that they are male and we are female or something like that. It's also about their daughters, their wives, their sisters who are going into society and going to face similar kind of things. So I feel once you know you sensitize people and then they realize that, yes, there is a problem and we should do something about it, then the buy-in is much more. So I think rather than just thrust it, you know, improving awareness, having meetings like this is really, really uh, important. And I'm really proud that as ISCCM through consensus, we've been able to put together at least 15 statements. And other societies, like Shrinivas rightly said, you know, we should collaborate with a few societies may have such position statements. And, you know, we can also learn from each other. So I, I really urge that, you know, if everyone can, you know, the society can really take this forward and people can follow it, it will go a long way in, uh, you know, achieving something that we thought about uh, in uh, last year. And at least it's a big step that going forward, I'm sure, will be continued. Thank you very much. Yes, ma'am. So I think, uh, you know, following all the position statements are within the purview of our national policies and laws. So if we can build enough pressure uh, by collaboration of different societies, if we can build enough pressure uh, uh, for forming adequate and appropriate government policies uh, in a more uh, you know comprehensive way i think that will go a long way for ensuring better workplace in all kinds of healthcare environments and uh, i think we had i i i i really appreciate all the panelists all our uh, uh, you know esteemed members to join us for today and it has been a wonderful discussion a very enlightening session uh, uh, the position statement that ma'am read out and the, and the future uh, initiatives that uh, Samavedam sir said that he has in mind. I think we are heading towards a very bright future. Okay, yeah, okay, yeah. <laughs> yes, definitely. Definitely. And thank you. Thank you so much, much all, all, the, the, all, the, all the panelists. The panelists. So we would so we uh, encourage, encourage, inspire, inspire and, and include and all the include talent all. rather than gender. So all the best to all the future intensivists. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you ma'am. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Bye. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, Srinivas. Thank Thanks, you, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Have a great time with your work. With your work. And and Wishing you all a very happy ICCM celebration week, Women's Day celebration. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.